The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. And when I started running, I suppose I didn't stop. And when I got the chance to go, I said I should go. And so I opened up. We were only the small little fish out there, so we are on that. We're trying hard to make it true. But it's hard to get the breaks when you're the smaller fish. Because I love this county so much, you know, and it's just, I'm delighted that the lads, the lads did it for the people of Walford today because, like, I, I'm, har- I'm heartbroken. Merry, merry, merry Christmas. Welcome along to the GAR brought to you by Paddy Power with myself, Conan Doherty, and Mr. Connor Heenahan. It is December 19th. And Dr. Crooks are still going very, very strong. Um, they're still in the East Kerry Championship, the O'Donoghue Cup, as they call it. Um, they played on Friday last year in the quarterfinal. They beat Neve Gullia 3 10 to 2 5. Then on Sunday, two, day, two days later, they played in the semi final. They beat Raf Moore 1 17 to 2 11. Now they've got the final on Saturday against Kilcommon on the 22nd of December, Fitzgerald Stadium, 2 15 pm. If you've got nothing else on, they're still going in Kerry. They're absolutely mad for it. Merry Christmas to them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are, yeah. And then uh, as soon as that's over, then they have to prepare for in the Mullen that they're playing in the semi-finals. Yeah, Mullen Yachta, so, as Mullen, we learned. Mullen Yachta, sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, can't see uh, can't see the Crokes boys having too hectic a schedule over Christmas, social-wise, anyway. It's absolutely mad. Like, and you just put it into, like, you think about uh, Vincent's just, just this day last week, last Wednesday night. They uh, won the, the Dublin Division 1 final. They beat uh, Bally Bowden in the league, uh, not 18-3-4. Like, you know, this has been played in December, what was that, December 11th, December 12th. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, and it's still, like, these seasons start back in December for a lot of people. They start yeah. training again, and it's just, oh, my God, like, you know, give us a rest. The, the thing is, like, Connor, we, 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 I think we bring this up every year. I think, like, <laughs> yeah, it's is, the same. Like, is there any, po- well, I suppose there is a point in continually rattling on, rattling on about it, because if you keep rattling on about it, then somebody should eventually yeah. listen. But like we we could tell you the same from 2017, 2016, 2015, going way back. I mean, is there like this is going to continue until they, as the CPA would say, fix the fixtures? But for the time being, with uh, Crow Park saying that they're not going to review them until the three year period that Super Eights is over, and with them adding more inter county games yeah. to the schedule, it's just going to keep going on. D- this is like the show is the same thing every. This is my third year with the show <laughs> now since Colin Parkin came on board, and like every year you can be sure it's the same thing over and over. So. It will come to the league, but we'll we'll not talk about it because we, we can't know until championship. Yeah. So every bit of analysis will always have that little asterisk. Yeah, yeah. Then April we'll start complaining about April for clubs because it's the first, <laughs> and we get all these stories. <laughs> championship will come around. We'll start complaining about TV games. What's not on TV? What RT have done? Do you know? And then how long the provincial series is going on, and like you know how we should restructure everything. Yeah. We'll try not to do it. Like, but um. The, the, but the thing is, I suppose as well is that like because adding extra inter county games to the schedule and like. You know, I think the jury is still out in the Super 8s. But the, even counties that, and like Kerry would probably won them, even though they have a lot of kind of different competitions, but would be assumed, would be, you know, perceived as a county that runs their fixtures well. But even counties now that run their fixtures well are, are having this problem and, and leading into f- like December. And it's it's not it's not just yeah. chronic mismanagement. It's that there's so many games. And because the summer is often left untouched because it's for county now. Yeah. Like clubs are just are left having to play games in December, even January. And that's it. Like, I remember making the point um, to you and Willie, but you were both right, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I was saying about, like, the, remember the idea was play the all Ireland final, the club all Ireland final around December. And I was like, would you really want to be playing your biggest game then? But then you were saying, Crew Park, it'll be fine. And you're like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's grand. But this is probably a problem, though, within counties and clubs. Like, so you're playing a Division 1 final league final which is up I know Vincent's probably don't care that much about it but it's up in St Margaret's in December lovely little ground but like the ground can get cut up up there it's in North yeah. Dublin awful conditions if it had been a worse winter like you know yeah. it would have been like you know God knows what it would have been like we like we won the Division 2 playoff but that's a home and away game or like it's actually it's either, it's either home or away so we were away so you're going down to a ground yeah. and God knows what it's like and it's a bit boggy down there and do you know when this like you're playing your most important game of the season in winter yeah. at the mercy of what the ground like how it's held up all year completely I think we made the point about the All-Ireland final being moved back to December purely because it's not fair on like there's a, it'll happen to Crokes this year yeah. Carfin Mullinachta uh, uh, not Kilmacroak Crokes as well like the teams that are in the semi-finals that the the players that like have county aspirations within that setup are prob- possibly going to be denied them because they're with their club until Paddy's Day and yeah. then like their their county's already well into the league at that stage unless they're established there could be a chance that they're going to lose out to somebody who's not playing club football but I completely agree I mean like th- this is again not to reiterate but this is the problem that like just comes back every single year is that like because 
the summer months when and like my, this summer Jesus this summer was like the best summer for playing football yeah. and, and like even as I said I play a club football in Mayo which would again be perceived it like it runs its fixtures quite well and I'd say during June and July like the prime months when the weather was brilliant I think I had two league games but that like yeah. as long as like realistically Crow Park or whoever are going to have to look at a potential separation of, of club and county because until that and until the club players constantly kind of look down on the, it's, it's just going to keep being the way that they're going to have to play these games in, in, in November, December, January and I'll tell you what's worse like never mind about the weather like I'm, I'm sure every single club person has both benefited and like you know been in the wrong end of this when you're playing games in November, December there's a lot of teams in the league who might be 7th or 8th and they're, yeah. you know, their season's over like they stopped training 3 months ago they might fulfil the fixture there might be a pile of reserves there or they might just start throwing points away like yeah, you know like it's yeah. nobody's business and then you start getting all these handy points and I've definitely like benefited from it before we've like we've avoided relegation because you get handy points at the end of the season or you're also looking on at somebody else getting handy points and you're like yeah. fuckers like you know oh, I've been at the opposite end, end of that I remember a few years ago we were um, we were trying to stay up and uh, we were relying on results from, from other yeah. matches and teams that had got a load of points early in the season and didn't need them later on they were losing to teams that were in direct competition with us whereas we had a good run at the end of the season and we actually won I think I remember like, we, I think we got 8 points from I think we got 8 points which would have been a, a, like at the start of the year if you were told you got 8 points you would have been okay you'll probably stay up but because of the way it kind of manifested itself that year yeah. we ended up going down but it was purely because of that because teams had got their teams got their wins earlier on in the season and they didn't care about it come the end so like I can completely see where you're coming from on that one yeah I know in Derry like it, it's um, no, it's easier with Derry because they're out in June every year but <laughs> they do it really well like it's like recently it's like the league is run off before the championship so even if you're like 7 for 8 for mid table like I'm giving that example you're coming up the championship then in a couple of weeks time so everybody still is sort of yeah, putting their best yeah. foot forward and preparing like so all the points still matter there's no games just thrown in on a Wednesday night just to get it done with everybody's playing yeah. at the same time like and but to be honest, like the scale of this, we, we we always talk about like how much needs to be done, and it sort of got hit home with me. Uh, it was just like yesterday, I got a text message from a mate in Germany. He's from Derry. He used to play for Derry actually, but he's been out of the loop for like seven years now. So he texted me and like Lavi, a club in Derry, just tweeted out saying it's great to host Derry for training tonight. You know, just like yeah, yeah, it's like a nice sort of proud moment when the county team comes down to train in your grounds. And I thought originally he sent me on the picture and I thought he was just going to slag them for boasting about it or something. Yeah. And he said, why the hell are Derry training on December 18th? And I was like, oh, like they've got a game against Tyrone on yeah, Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was like, what? And I was like, the inter-county season started two weeks ago. What are you talking about? Uh, how long is this guy out of the loop? <laughs> like seven years. Yeah, like, yeah actually. He should, yeah. yeah, he should, actually should be well in the loop. Like, and yeah. I just wrote back to him saying, welcome to the GA fixture chaos. Like, you yeah, know, you, you've yeah, missed yeah. it. Like, yeah, that's for counties here. I, I, like, I think we're going to talk about it, but like clubs are clubs are well back at training and back training well in advance and not just like counties are probably a lot of counties been there since the start of November but like clubs are starting to do the same thing and you're just into this never ending cycle yeah. of a season do you know and that just brought me on to what I was going to start giving out about some clubs <laughs> Here you go. Like, yeah because <laughs> like not only like you know am I giving out about seasons ending so late but there's so many club teams back already they've been back since November like and and going absolutely flat out now I know everybody's always in different trajectories and they have different time frames and stuff like that but you really need a break like like I actually 100% yeah like I find you know we've talked about this before but come to the end of the season you're just sort of fed up with everybody and you want to, you want to sort of get away and have that time to yourself again but what actually happens then when you're when you're not training is you do train because yeah. you've got the time to yourself and then I don't know about you but I get so paranoid about what everybody else is doing because you don't know Definitely. what anybody's doing yeah so then yeah, you yeah. actually do more than you probably would but yeah. the fact that it's on your own time and nobody's texting you and there's yeah. not that sort of pressure to show up in some place every single week it's just uh, it's so much better yeah. for your mental health like there's no better motivator for me anyway than if i heard a oh, conan's in the gym and he's doing this like, what yeah Conlon's in the gym and he's doing this <laughs> and i know it's not a particularly healthy way to look at it because you should be able to determine what works best for you and like yeah. within reason as long as what as long as I heard that what you were doing what was within reason and not absolutely ridiculous, I'd be thinking, oh God, I have to get to the gym or I have to yeah. do this, that and the other. But that's going to be the, like I, the last few years I've started, it's not that I look forward to the end. I do look forward to the end of the season the way I don't look forward to going out, like going out of championship or, you know, yeah, having your league game like, yeah. being over. But I do look forward to those couple of months because like the perception of pre-season is that pre, like, you know, or sorry, the off-season is that like 
players go away the, the old kind of school you know <laughs> off season they go away they do nothing they, their social life in, you know their social activity increases which it should anyway um, but that they do not but that doesn't happen anymore I mean like people just because people like to get fit they just do it in different ways you know like yeah. I know I like to I, I wouldn't go road running let's say during the summer because I, I think it kind of it would counteract what you're doing um, you know GA training do you know that kind yeah. of way but I like to do it in winter to keep myself taking over do different stuff in the gym and then by the time you're going back to actual training in a few months time it that it in itself has given you a new lease of life because you're not doing what you had been doing for the yeah. couple months before that but that's it but that's it this is like that that break that you're on about is I, I think it's crucial and it's like you don't get the same break come the summer but the, se- the GA season is so long now that you need that pre-season you need that off-season sorry around Christmas time yeah. and I also think that you need it's not an official off-season like in Mayo they give us two weeks off at the end of July where a lot of people kind of book holidays but if you can afford that and I know we're giving out about fixtures and they should be played yeah. during the summer but like something to break up that monotony as well because otherwise you're talking 10 months at least 11 months nearly the whole year and that just like people get bored and it's it's no other kind of people go off football and stuff like that when there's such demands on people yeah time. and think how many times like this is like if you're in a club now that's already training but think how many times like, training's going to get like quote unquote ramped up <laughs> yeah. you know throughout <laughs> the year now like and it's going to happen in January because you'll probably be in the gym now at the minute yeah. but in January it's going to get ramped up because you'll be doing a lot of running and you'll yeah. be run, you know, getting it into the legs or whatever but then before the league you'll ramp it up because you need to get like you'll be talking about that one team that you're playing because you've got the fixture <laughs> yeah. eight weeks out you know yeah. you just constantly talk about this one team and forget about the 15 other games yeah. that are to come yeah. so you'll ramp it up before then then you'll ramp it up in that break that you're talking yeah, about because yeah, like you know yeah. it's like we've got a chance now to get an extra pre-season and then before championship you'll you'll go at it again so you, you have to sort of keep peaking for all these things anyway yeah. and this is again another reason why you, you just need to sort of go away for a couple of months and then come back sort of refreshed definitely mentally more than anything because i do hate the like i hate the constant like sort of messages as well so you're always on like you know you're always sort of you know reading stuff and being told to drink water or like you know be prepared today don't, don't yeah f- like you know don't just be leave me alone around. yeah yeah <laughs> do you know and like, like uh, around this time of the year we also get a lot of emails and they say like a lot of whistleblowers from clubs around the country boys complaining about contracts that they had to sign or yeah you know bo- somebody from uh ulster sent this like you know whatsapp group image in the other day and it was um Oh, like we, we've all heard this one, but they have to take a picture every time they're in the gym. Now, but everyone knows the way around that now. Uh, like, yeah. just bring a couple of teachers <laughs> if you want. Like, you know, but but even just this, so like this group is now filled with people taking pictures of themselves in the gym. Yeah, that, that that's getting way too common as well. The GA is terrible for uh, imitation as opposed to innovation. So, yeah. if, like, if you heard if you heard that the club next year. these lads, these are in, they're in the gym three <laughs> times a week, and they're taking a picture every time they're in the gym. <laughs> yeah. And like it's butty as in like it, it like as in well we have to start doing that why like do you know like it, like <laughs> yeah. why do you have to manage my life to that extent can you not like it's one thing if you like if there's kind of constant monitoring of 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 your progress as opposed to you having actually to take a picture if your lad could take a picture in the gym just go to the gym take a picture and actually do nothing but yeah you can still put the picture up in the WhatsApp say he was there yeah do you know what I mean whereas if you're if you're actually monitoring their progress in terms of your uh, and I know we're getting very scientific here as well but like say you know you test them maybe at the start of February and then six weeks later you test them again then to see are they making any progress yeah. as opposed to well I haven't come on any you know any bit at all but I have sent a WhatsApp message <laughs> every six you know it's just yeah yeah it's ridiculous you're sending a picture of all these extra weights just added on to the <laughs> yeah, bench press yeah. as well. put on more weights there are no more <laughs> <laughs> yeah like but like it is fun because I, I don't like sounding like an old dinosaur as well because the funny thing is like I did sports science in college like you know but I'm always giving out about like you know what people are doing and these fads that they're doing and stuff that I can absolutely see the benefit of so for example like we had a coach one time a conditioning coach and he was actually quite good but we spent a lot of time like you know working on sort of running techniques mm. and like how to land properly and you know functional movement and stuff like again stuff that you can yeah. see a benefit of but when you're training two nights a week or three nights a week for 60 to 90 minutes like that's too valuable I think yeah. like I think this stuff is like extra Absolutely. stuff if you're an NFL player it's going to help get a couple of a fraction of seconds off it depends on how they get across they get that message across like I I know I don't want to sound like an old dinosaur either but like I would have definitely when I like I started to kind of feel the benefits of, of prehab and preparation more so later in my career and I actually wished a career I call it but um, you know I wish that I actually paid that much attention kind of earlier on but it's it's about how that's communicated if you get a guy in for a session and he takes 60 minutes or an hour and a half to go through stuff like as you said functional movement landing techniques whatever whereas if he does 
if he was to try and communicate that in maybe 15 20 minutes do you know and just like short and sharp and like while he still has people's attention because if you do that for too long you are losing you're just like like the, the more you rattle on you're just losing the group yeah. straight away it has to be you know very well communicated and like the you know kind of given examples of the benefits that it can provide as well you know so um, but I, I, I would agree it's just sometimes that there's way too much emphasis on that sort of stuff yeah. and not on the the basics that you actually yeah. require like. and I, again like I'm not it's all context I'm not I'm not knocking that stuff but it's like I do think that so many people are obsessed with finding that last one or two percent in the GA like they're desperate to find it that, that little bit extra that's why you see all these different new fads and stuff mm. that they sort of forget about the the 98 to 99 percent of stuff like and I think yeah. you should only really be concentrating on that last one and two you think what what can I do different now to, to sort of get us over that line like yeah. like Mayo say yeah you know yeah, it's yeah. only when you have the 98 99 percent done then yeah. you can start looking at that stuff that's exactly it yeah yeah and sometimes I wish that as much attention was paid to and I'm sure like at like at intercounty level it's it's way more kind of scientific and specific and stuff like that. But sometimes yeah. having I'd say every every club player has gone through this sort of thing at some stage and you're wishing that they just paid more paid as much attention to the nuts and bolts stuff as they actually do to or they might get a guy in for six sessions in a row and he's all like it's all about stretching and functional movement and stuff like that, which is is beneficial. But are you doing six weeks in a row maybe setting up attacking plays or how you're going to set up against a specific team or like one of the things that I found just training over the years is that like because it's just some of the basic skills are just assumed that that you just have them like as in the, the, the simple matter of putting the ball over the bar just like maybe doing that everybody gets to do maybe 20 or 30 shots you know it's just oh we don't need to do that so you know how to do that and then you're wondering why you have 15 or 20 wides during a game you know that kind yeah. of way so there, I, I have found that imbalance between trying to really striving to get that one percent and then as you said just forget yeah. <laughs> the 99 that works in the first place and i'm speaking from experience because like I, I coached a famous under 16 team that i coached but i remember the first year was in with them and i was you know trying to be this real like coach carter again you comes yeah. in with all these different it's ideas like 30, 30 coming on that i can tell <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, like i remember halfway through uh one of the seasons i just i might have been at a talk with mickey moore or somebody who had real sense like and it was something about football and those like skills being assumed as you say so I got them all lined up then one day, this is like June, and you just got them to race with the ball. So you're just doing a normal sprint, but you're running with the ball. I swear to God, one person made it up to the far line without dropping, dropping the ball. The ball. Yeah. I was yeah. watching going, oh, bollocks. Like, what, <laughs> what the hell have I been doing with these boys? Yeah. Like, you know, Because it hasn't been Gaelic football. They can't solo the ball to themselves. But they were the best functional movers of the under-16 <laughs> yeah. Derry Championship that year. You want to see year. the way they were landing. Like, they were brilliant at landing. But um, like funny, I slag Willie about being an old timer. Now listen to us two here, like, yeah, you know, know. <laughs> just giving out what the kids are doing these days. Uh, Parky Keeve, it's an absolute mess at the minute. Um, so the Peace and Areas Examiner, um, the Crew Park Stadium and Commercial Director Peter McKenna has been talking to them. He's estimated that the final cost of redeveloping Parky Keeve will come close to 110 million um, euros, which is 24 million more than what the 2017 estimate was. And now Crew Park has been summoned in to help for three years. There was a convention on Saturday and there was a claim at that meeting that uh, 86 million, the figure that was banded around at the start, said that's how much it would cost, that that was the total cost of the project, which doesn't really reflect well on the executive then when it has been revealed that yeah. it's actually 110 million, there's 24 million on a oh, contract. That's just that they had 24 million. Like. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about the 24 million. Like, you know, yeah. And this is at the convention. Like, um, so since then, there's been a newly formed board of directors um, for Parky Cueve, and they held the first meeting on Tuesday. They're chaired by GA President John Horn, um, uh, Michael Flynn, Tom Gray are both there, and they're tasked with examining figures, as well as to clarify costs and relating to Cork Stadium redevelopment to sort of clarify what the hell's happened with the money. But basically, they've overspent on the stadium. The whole pitch needs dug up, apparently. Yeah, yeah, uh, and this is that. the first year of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Crew Park have now intervened, and they're going to be there for three years. Woolley would have a field day I think if he, if he <laughs> was know. here because obviously his bugbear is that like county boards should be run like a business like with managing directors chairpersons etc to, 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 to try and ensure the smooth running of stuff like this because um, this is like like the Galway thing that's going on yeah. at the moment but the mismanagement of finances there is absolutely ridiculous yeah. um, and j just going like speaking of stadiums um, what Caseman Park is still still up in the air I think yeah. uh, for the time being anyway and I was reading that like what what happens with Parky Cueve might have an actual impact on what happens with Caseman Park and even going back to Mayo 
like Mayo went into serious debt with the mis- mismanagement of Mikhail Park over the years. Like so, this this isn't a this isn't an occasional thing. It's not a one off. Yeah. you know what I mean. And like the like the GA, whether they like it or not, and I I'd say that a lot of people within the GA would kind of resent the the grab all association kind yeah. of tag that goes with it. But like when you see figures being bandied like that, and like the fact that this comes from some of this was paid for by the government as well it's taxpayers money and stuff like that and like you can't blame them for, for wondering what the hell is the story exactly you say taxpayers money like it is, that, that's really dangerous like you know yeah. people like to bash the government and what they're spending and whatever but like they put money into the park of Creve and like this is money from everybody in the country yeah. and then there's just 24 million on a country yeah, for exactly, it. Yeah. as of Saturday and then Tuesday it's completely different and I think you McKenna was tweeting now some people are projecting that it's going to be closer to 40 million like you know now this is just other people projecting that but you McKenna was tweeting saying that the overspend alone if it is getting up to close to 40 million will be the same cost as the likes of Liberty Stadium St Mary Stadium King Power Stadium yeah. so all these new Premier League grounds so that, that's just the overspend never mind the whole cost of the stadium the extra money that they spent would have built Premier League grounds and do you know what like, like when, you, when you mentioned the, those Premier League grounds in particular they're kind of I, I don't know the capacities off the top of my head but they're medium sized you yeah. know Premier League grounds whereas the GA seems to have well that's the Swansea Southampton and Leicester like the yeah. Champions yeah they're all nice like medium sized grounds exactly yeah. Com- compact like I'd say I would I would guess I would estimate in the region of 25,000 to 40,000 yeah. capacity whereas the GA seems to have an obsession with these grand kind of arenas do you know what I mean like for the size of like uh, I, I would be the, the opinion like we're, the whole Newbridge situation this year for example Walsh Park and Waterford I think every county ground should have a really serviceable like top quality in you know ground that they can call home but it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be 30 or 40 thousand do you know what i mean it could be yeah. like how often are they going to fill that yeah, do you know true. what i mean but yet we have looking at this happen with park we've looking at caseman park i mentioned mikhail park earlier on and like is it a thing that like while if if every county had something that like adhered to all the health and safety restrictions whatever and like capacity figures that that are required by the ga but like then would you be looking at a thing of centralizing like the biggest games in provinces because like how how often are these grounds that cost so much money um how often are, and and like te- often tend to lose money then after that yeah. as well do you know what i mean how often are these being filled whereas yeah. you could have if if you were to be more pragmatic about it and build stadiums of those medium perfectly serviceable medium sized stadiums that would be i i would say would be a far far greater benefit yeah, like it's it's real sobering because like I'm thinking of Derry and Derry have a stadium that's sort of twenty grand or twenty thousand I'd say yeah. around that um and it's never filled like, yeah, you know exactly yeah and it's eight or nine thousand it's like wow this is class yeah like, but, but if Derry get a game if they get a home Ulster championship game perfectly suitable to field yeah. uh, and home Ulster championship game perfectly suitable to get somebody in the qualifiers if they get an Ulster final if they go to Clonus yeah like I don't see the why like and um, I know Cork like Cork obviously being Cork the the real capital or whatever would have to and Porky Creeve is iconic and like they would see themselves of having to have a stadium like that but it, within Munster alone then within I would say a radius of you know like like a two hour drive you'd have Killarney which is 40,000 I think and Thurless <laughs> obviously which is the biggest which is the the big, the big dog in Munster which it, which can hold something like 70,000 people do you need that amount of grounds in that vicinity yeah like, I, I don't know I, I, th- I think it's something like the stadiums are built already so what what could, what can they do but it it just maybe hints at, at some bad planning on behalf of the GA well don't despair because John Horn has come out and no. he has said I am delighted that the GA has such a positive asset in Cork and I am optimistic about the future of what is a state-of-the-art facility. There you go. So there you go. Why, why well, am I even asking uh, yeah. about the 24 <laughs> million? So that's it. That's the present. That's, that's all done, done, and done and dusted. dusted. Mickey Hurt has been very bullish in the media, I thought. He, um, he came out and he just basically said, Tyrone want to get back to the All-Ireland final. Don't know how my old men will think of that. But he's come out and he said, that's our aspiration now to get back there. If you want to get used to the experience of last year's final, then you can only get back to the final. I'm not saying it won't be of some use for us to try and progress through the championship, but that's a long way off. So he's just sort of talking about then one game at a time. Yeah. But his point is, I want to get back there. I think we've a resilient enough side now. We've spent enough time. So even if we get knocked out of the Ulster Championship, we've we enough time in the qualifiers, in the bank, not to be too downhearted and we'll find ourselves in the qualifiers. But his whole aim is to get back to the all in final. And I really like that. Like It's just somebody coming out and saying, let's do it. I, I don't think that's particularly bullish to be no. honest you reached the all Ireland final last year you've been semi-finalist twice in the last regularly in the top so 14 2015 it? semi-final 2016 quarter-final lost to Mio by yeah. a point um, 2017 semi-final 
against Dublin 2018 final been either if, I, if I'm not mistaken been knocked out by Mayo Dublin or Kerry in the last Kerry four, Mayo Dublin yeah and the only other team that beaten them was uh, Monaghan uh, last year last year before, before they bet them again yeah, yeah. so like you're, you're within the top four you're clearly within the top four teams in the country only two of them are going to reach the final surely that's your your, your ambition to be one of them <laughs> you're raining uh, on my parade here uh, well I'm sorry no I saw, I saw that I was like well what, what's he going to say well if we make it to a semi-final we'll be doing okay Do you yeah. know that kind of way? I know it's a very kind of Irish thing to be kind of playing down your expectations but like uh, I, 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 I thought that was a very realistic kind of um, aspiration for Mickey Hart and Tyrone this year <laughs> very good alright I'll leave it there <laughs> well right. actually, all their news in Tyrone is actually it, it, this, maybe this is why they're aiming for the final yeah. because Peter the Great is going to have a stamp in Tyrone again young Dara Canavan son of Peter has been called up despite not playing senior championship for his club just yet he uh, he did shoot the lights out though in the Division 1 final which was played at a more acceptable time it was in December uh, for <laughs> Ergo Cairn um, and that was against St. Dendas of Roma, like so not just any old club like and it's a big rivalry and they're one of the proper big dogs of Tyrone um, and Peter Hart who's a club mate that Eric O'Keefe was talking about him he said I'm not really surprised that he's in the panel to be honest himself and another young lad Matthew Murnahan from Killy Clogher are both 18 we s- are both 18 like <laughs> that's what it says <laughs> in the Irish news we're both 18 like we saw them playing against each other actually in a county minor final this year and the two of them stood out they're two great lads and two great players so when you have that potential those boys they're great to have on the panel Derek Canavan did you see any of the clips of him playing minors uh, only only briefly but like everything I've heard about like, like, it, we, like we would have talked we've obviously talked about David Clifford a lot and before David Clifford kind of tore it up in the minor championship before he became a senior yeah. it was like Jesus can this guy really be as good as they're letting on and he was and he's better Yeah. Uh, everything I've heard about Derek Canavan suggests that he's going to be amazing and like there's there's obviously a lot of pressure that kind of comes with that but then because of that you often hear that like the people that surround them then try to play down expectations but what it seems with Derek Hanavan is that he's too good that the likes of <laughs> Peter Carrick can't yeah. even can't even if he tried to play down ex- expectations no no he he's going to be amazing yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah I uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of him yeah definitely not quite the David Clifford just yet but he's still Peter yeah, Canavan's son yeah, well that's so, it yeah like, we can be very excited about him yeah, yeah. And another forward for Tyrone like here we go yeah like, yeah yeah I just hope it kind of uh, obviously the whole father son thing we've seen like loads in, in football some of them live up to it like Paolo Maldini yeah some of them Jordi Cruyff don't so <laughs> <laughs> he's quite good he's quite good he's just obviously not going to be the same as his dad <laughs> um Owen Murphy has been given out um, on Twitter and <laughs> he really has a point, right? So there's a piece on uh, the Sports U website by Niall McIntyre and he talks about uh, West Meath Club, Multi Farnham. Last year they were in the all Ireland Junior Football Final. But they go up the week before up to Crew Park because they're in the final, so they want to go up and see where they're going to be playing. Get to see the changing rooms, but they're not allowed onto the pitch. Um, you know, they're, like, they're allowed to do everything else, allowed to tour the vicinity, but they're not allowed onto the pitch. Um, and it turns out it was the same for Glen Moore. Um, which is Owen Murphy's club, the junior hurling final in 2016 they were in. They got a you know tour of the changing rooms and stuff like that. They got to look at the pitch, but they weren't allowed on. And when you look at the pictures, then it is a bit sort of daunting. Like they were playing actually Owen Rio Coleraine um, from Derry, and uh, like you know you just see a big picture of a sort of empty crew park. This is in the background mm-hmm. anyway, and you see these these junior hurlers playing, and you're like, whoa, like that's that is the very first time they're getting onto that pitch is when they come on to warm up. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. can only imagine like how scary it would be, but. So Owen Murphy's come out and it was absolutely brilliant, right? So you're watching Ireland's fittest family, aren't you? Like you're a big was, Dancing yeah. with the Stars fan. This is, <laughs> this is right up your alley. Winter reality TV, <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, Joe O'Connor, so he seems to be a referee. I think he's involved with Limerick actually as a coach there, a conditioning coach maybe. So he just puts up a harmless enough video and uh, <laughs> he's doing a trial run around Crook Park where Ireland's fittest family final appears to be and there's all these obstacles and he's climbing over the wall and it's just this it just seems to be him on his own in the empty Crook Park climbing over this wall and landing on a, a big soft mat and running on to the next one and Owen Mur- <laughs> it's <laughs> one of the obstacle courses in Ireland's fittest family I'm pretty right. sure yeah. so Owen Murphy just quote tweets it and says so when Glenmore got a tour in Crook Park before the Club All Ireland 2016 we couldn't walk on the grass Yet they leave this shite go on. <laughs> when you see it in the context and you see this little yeah, video yeah, going yeah, underneath yeah. his tweet and your man jumping over the wall <laughs> and then running over the hill 16 and jumping up another wall, it is. It's absolutely mad when you think yeah. about it. I just wonder when um, when that rule was brought in because uh, it gives me a, a, an ideal opportunity to tell my Crow Park story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got to uh, an All Ireland Junior final in um, 2010 and we went, right. up to, we went up the day before, so we played on the Sunday. So I think they rotated every year. So the junior and intermediate finals, the hurling is on. The hurling was on the Saturday that year, 
football was on the Sunday I think they, then the next year football will be on the Saturday night and then and, the and yours was Saturday was it? Or no ours was on the Sunday but we went up Saturday so the right. hurling was on that Saturday night oh, and we right, were there yeah. on Saturday afternoon but same as uh, same as Glenmore we were given the tour of um, tour of the dress rooms then, but we got to go out on the pitch and funny enough uh, Cass Gregory from Kerry who were playing at the time were on the pitch at the same time oh, right. they were down one end and we were down the other but there was no we weren't <laughs> we weren't told anything it was just like there was 30 of us went out on the pitch we had footballs and everything it wasn't a training session but it was just a kick around and I made sure to score a point because I knew I yeah, probably wouldn't exactly. one day. <laughs> I made sure <laughs> I knew I probably wouldn't get to the score one the following day so I uh, made sure to score a point and just then we were just kicking around for about 20 minutes but no no restrictions whatsoever so I've no I've no idea why like you can Listen, f- like it's fair enough on Crow Park to in- introduce a rule that you're not allowed on the pitch, but l- apply it everywhere. Yeah, you know, and like uh, you can see how it'll get on people's grill if, if something like Ireland's for this family. I'm sure there's a big contract with RTE that they're allowed <laughs> shoot the fi- like shoot the final there, but it's just not a good look. Yeah, like uh, Joe Connor is just like, he's just caught in a crossfire here. Yeah, like, you know, <laughs> he's just collateral damage. Connor. And this is yeah. just just hilarious that that was the video on the Leaf on Murphy's tweet. So that was 2016 that Owen Murphy's talking about. The one Niall was talking about, uh, Multi Farnham was twenty seventeen. You're talking about twenty ten, and you were allowed on. We all know why you would be, especially Crew Park. Like you want to get on the pitch and yeah. see what it's like from where you'll yeah, be playing. Like I'm not saying it gave us any huge benefit to be on the pitch. Yeah, like it was. It was great to kind of see the vantage point from. I oh, got to look up at the big screen and just kind of got to take in your surroundings. As you said, and like I, I'm not saying I'm into visualization or whatever, but if somebody was, they could stand in the centre half back spot or exactly, stand, like, stand yeah. in the corner forward spot and like you know get to get to just see what what it's going to be like for them the following day but um we we'd like i'd I'd say no more than ourselves they got a sufficient enough warm up then before before the game the next day but it just it's it's just you're so close and then you can't you're just like yeah. the pitch is just there and you're on it's, and you can't awful. touch it yeah and then you put that into the reality of like you know June 2011 Take That concert was on right in the middle of the summer you know July 2017 U2 concert just right after the Leinster final and all these pictures are on sports right of you know the grass getting brought up and this you know new sort of like surface laid down yeah, for the yeah. concert and stuff and, and then there was a, a brilliant picture July 2009 just a big dump of sod just lying in the middle of Crew Park right in the middle of the summer like you know and you yeah. can't get 30 players on to walk around in their trainers that's it yeah and you wonder what harm it's going to do even if it is shortly before a game like but like you know within a couple of hours there's people going to be on there on studs but yeah. I'm sure Crow Park will have some kind of official line on it but exactly up next uh, we got Stephen Poacher <laughs> Okay, delighted to say that Carlo's senior football coach, Stephen Poacher, is on the line. Stephen, you're one of the key figures of Carlo Rising. How are you coping with all the fame? I, well, it's Carlo Rising had nothing to do with me. That was something <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, <laughs> that was that was labelled a few years ago on on social media. It's like, no, listen, we're enjoying it, Con. You know, I think you know people probably maybe on the outside look in and probably say about Carlo and the exposure we get, and you know, and we we talk to the media maybe more usually than than most people, but. For me, Conan, like there's, there's deeper issues there. You know, like well, Carlos competing. It's a very, very small county. It's the second smallest county in Ireland, in fact. You know, and it's competing with the likes of Sean O'Brien with rugby. You know, it's competing with with soccer. You've Padraig Gammon there as well, playing for Newport, who's big profile. You know, obviously Hurland for the size of the county. You know, Hurland the Hurland teams competing. They won the Joe McDonough last year. They're now up in Division One B. You know, they were in the Liam McCarthy at one stage last year as well. So to compete with all that, you know, the more exposure that football gets in the county, Conan, the more young people that will want to play the football you know and I can't underestimate the, the impact that the two games on Sky Sports had for us a couple of years ago mm. with Monaghan and Dublin you know what that does for further on down the food chain it, it's it, you can't measure that you know you really can't measure that and you know the more exposure that football in Carlo gets because you got to come from where you got to realise where we're coming from just before Turlock took the job Carlo were beat by 28 points in the championship by Mead and finished rock bottom at Division 4 you know so we're coming from a very very low base now this last few years and for where we are now and what it's done, like the academies, the, the, the Carlo Colts is flying. There's serious work going on there with Sean Gannon, Ronan Dempsey are doing fierce work there behind the scenes. You know, all of a sudden it's fashionable again to, to want to play for Carlo. You know, there's there, there's people that want to play for Carlo now. And I suppose I got a little glimpse during the summer when I went down to the golf day and, you know, I met a, I met a guy actually at it and he was saying, look, we tried to get a we tried to get a Carlo jersey to put on the mannequin mm. at the golf day and they couldn't get one because they were sold out. And at the Hall <laughs> Ireland final... Uh, myself and the wife were, were, were in Myers before the game and I noticed a Carlo jersey in the distance and the gentleman and his daughter came over and the daughter was wearing the jersey and it happened, happened to be his sister actually, Brian Cawley, who was a member of the panel and he says to me, look, you see five years ago, this girl wouldn't even have dreamt of wearing a Carlo jersey up here, you know, she's, but she's proud of work now, you know, and it, it's it's massive, Cornerfield County, like it's huge, like, you know, and it, it is it is a big, big 
part of you know the progress and development that the county hopefully will continue to make like you know that's brilliant because i was just going to ask you do you feel like a change in the place but is, is it sort of gone this days now do you feel like there's even a bit more critical analysis within the county itself like are people that involved in it Fuck yeah, there's no doubt. Listen, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get criticism no matter what you do or where you go. Like you're never gonna please everyone, and you know, for us, we we just keep doing what we're doing. All we want to do is compete. You know, it's, it's mm. not, it's not, you know, we're not looking to do anything else but really compete. And I suppose we we have a very we have a very relaxed atmosphere in the camp. You know, we, we we've we've a happy camp. I'd like to think we've a happy camp. You know, the players are happy. They enjoy going to training. They enjoy playing football. We enjoy it ourselves. You know, and and we don't, you know, we don't put media bans on people. We don't sort of. We don't talk about drink bans. We don't do anything that we celebrate wins. You know, we we, we celebrate defeats. You know, you win together, you lose together, and you know, and, and we're enjoying it. Like, but look, obviously, you know, as expectation levels within the county will raise, then obviously, you know, people within the county obviously will start to look maybe in a more analytical point of view and say, well, can we do this and can we do that and can we change this and can we change that and could he play there and could he not be playing? But you're you're going to get that no matter where you go. You'll get that in your in your junior club team, you know, and you'll get yeah. it in a senior club team. You get it everywhere you go. So. It's it's no real different to that, but I think I think it's been huge, and I think last year, you know, the lift that it gave the county, you know, kind of, you know, life is tough at times, you know, and it, it can be tough out there, like and and to give uh, people said to me, I remember Benji O'Brien, one of the selectors, said to me, people in Carlo, all they've ever done is is wanted a team to follow, you know, and I don't think that they could have complained over the last few years, like we've had some great days out and. We played three of last year's All Ireland semi finalists over the last two seasons, and you know we had our days out in Croker against Leash, and you know all, all right, they didn't go our way, but like there was there was nearly ten thousand people in Crow Park that day from Charlo, like which is which is phenomenal, like it's it's absolutely yeah. brilliant for the county, you know. So hopefully, hopefully onwards and upwards, you know. So tell me, how did a, a down man come to be involved in Carlo? Yeah, well, I know, I know. Uh, um, Column there would probably say I was chased out of down, but that's actually not the true story. Like no, I was uh, no, it was actually quite quite funny because um, I, look, I'd, I'd worked for ten years with with, with down at at all levels, you know, from under fifteen right through to under twenty one, and I'd coached at, at senior club level and down for ten years in Division One, and you know, I was just I was just finding things, you know, probably a bit mundane and a bit stale, and you know, obviously at that time Turlock and Tommy, I was running a coaching day in in Kilkeel actually, and last year it was it was the largest coach education event in Ulster. We had over 175 coaches at it, and this year and this more, we actually had. I took it to this more this year, and we had 240 coaches from all over Ulster. But uh, Turlock and Tommy used to attend the day, and they approached me way back in November 2015 and said, "You know, would you come in and take a couple of sessions?" So in 2016, I took I think two, three sessions throughout the year. I uh, just won before the, the the championship game again. Now won before the the qualifier again, Wicklow, and then won before the the game against uh, Cavan in the qualifier. So I had three or four sessions, and a I really liked the, the setup. I seen Fena. I got to look around the place, and uh, you know it was a really good setup. And later in that summer, Turlock had sort of said to me, "Why don't you come on board on a more on a more full time sort of basis?" Like, and obviously had to speak to the boss at home and see what she thought. But sure, you know her life was engro- engrossed in football too. Her father would have played for Tyrone for ten years. So Marie is a, is a football woman, and she understands the demands that that would have been that would have been made. You know, and and the sacrifices that would have been made. So she says, "Look, go for it." So. Started training them in November 2016, and then we we had our best national league in 12 years. We just missed out in promotion by by a point, and then we went in that championship run where we had five championship games, and and we got the a bit of momentum going, Conan. And we decided in year two then that we'd really push for promotion, and and we, and we got it, you know. So it, it's been work in progress, but Turlock's Turlock's done sterling work behind the scenes. Turlock's I can't speak highly enough of Turlock as as a not even just as a, as a football man, Conan, but as a person. You know, he's a fantastic human being, and. You know, he's a real family man. He just loves Carlo. He loves everything about Carlo. He wrote a book on, on cycling and talking about cycling routes in Carlo. He loves the Barrowway, and I think sometimes he'd prefer to live in a, in a tent on the Barrowway than live with his wife in the house, you know. But, uh, no, he, he's a great guy, and he just loves and sleeps, eats, sleeps, and drinks Carlo football, you know. And I think that was a big thing, too, Conan, which I think is very important in any management team. There was a great chemistry among us, you know, and... Mm. and the players were good guys and, and good players, but there's nice chemistry among the management team as well. And, you know, we all get on well. And, and I think that's important. And that reflects then in, in the ethos of the group then as well, you know. And how is it that, like, obviously you've got a good dynamic with Turlock, but how does it work then, I suppose, on the training pitch? Like, are you taking the training sessions? Like, what, I'm always interested to see how coaches are with the managers and what way does it work between each county? I don't know, I suppose, when, when I went in a couple of years ago, you know, Turlock, we talked about you know role clarity and role acceptance among the players, but it's the exact same among the coaching staff as well. Like we don't have a massive coaching staff, like but you know when we, when we met the players in 2016, like we would have we would have made the roles of the coaching staff very clear. Damien Sheehan does sterling work there with the 
with the strength and conditioning in, in Carlow IT and, and looks after the players fantastically well and you know Turlock just more or less had t- told me in 2016 I'd be in charge of the football coaching so you know I would take all the football as such you know but it's it's uh, no, it works well it's a nice dynamic you know and, and you know that we've uh, Tommy Wogan our Turlock's loyal assistant for many years now with, with the club and the county and Benji O'Brien and Lachlan man as well is there as well as as eyes in the stand, you know, and it's 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 good it's good dynamics and we've obviously added Kieran Roach this year, uh, Scary's man, uh, who's been managing Scary's and Kieran's come in and he's done a little bit of coaching with the boys as well, which is good too, and he's dipped his, his foot into it and he, he's enjoying it as well, you know. So yeah. it's, very uh, very it's good, good manager over a very good team there, I might add, so he is. So, so I believe Conan yeah, he speaks very highly yourself like he says now because you're a little bit lazy off the ball so I don't know if you'd fit into our system like, you know, that's the only reason I really wanted to ask but now you're ruining it for me <laughs> <laughs> no, like, well, it was interesting because I remember like this is <laughs> when I was a minor I remember taking a team under uh, there was a manager there and we were working on this thing before championship whatever system we were playing but then it came to championship and it was almost like he wasn't at the sessions and he was just doing something completely different to what we had been working on and yeah. I obviously blame him for it then but have you ever found anything <laughs> like that you know that uh, have you been button heads at all like you know where he's obviously the manager but you're working on something and does it always come out like the way you might want it to come oh, out yeah no listen I think myself and Turlock are singing from the same hymn sheet like you know I think we, we all are you know and I think we know that you know we, we, we play in a certain way and you know and that's you know football has changed I suppose a little bit you know and and I suppose any plan is better than no plan, you know, and I, I always believe, and this is something that I, I've always said to the players, like, you know, I think if you might have the best plan in the country, you know, it might be the best plan, it, it might be the best game plan, it might be the best way of playing football, um, but all the players don't buy into it, then it's not worth anything, you know, but if you've got if you've got a plan that, that 100% of the players buy into a game plan, and everybody knows what they're doing, and there's real clarity, and there's real acceptance, then you have a chance, you have a chance to compete, and that's ultimately what we want to do. All we want to do, Conan, is really just is compete, you know. And that's, you know, we're not talking about winning all Ireland's or winning Lancers. Like we want to compete. We want to progress as much as we can. We want to leave a legacy in place. You know, this team can make their own little bit of tradition for Carlo, which they already have done. They were the most successful Carlo team in 75 years last year. Where the people might argue that, against it, but they were, you know. And for me, that's you know we had our first promotion in 40 years, which was huge for the county. And it's about leaving that little bit of legacy that will hopefully that will hopefully leave a, a, a system and a, and, a, and, and something, a structure in place that young lads coming through then, it's a natural progression, and all of a sudden then it becomes fashionable to play for the county, people will want to play for the county, and it filters on down through the food chain. You know, you now have minor players looking up to, you know, the Danielson Ledgers and the Dara Foley's and the Paul Brodericks and the Brendan Murphy's. They're looking up to these players saying, you know, I want a piece of that, you know, and they're coming through the under-20s. I went to watch the under-20s playing last year. You know, there's some tremendous talent in that team, you know, some brilliant young lads like some young Connor Doyle and, Josh Moore and Niall Roach and those lads, Connor Crowley, and those lads are all stepped up into the senior panel now, which is the first time in a long time that Carlos had a natural, you know, evolution that they've brought those young lads through, which is which is fantastic for the county, you know. So I do feel that you know it's it's important, like, it's important, and I think that in any game or any team you're involved in, like you know, you you need to have a plan or a structure going forward, like for it to be successful. Like. Yeah, and like you're going into your third full season, I suppose, with them now, and you, nobody can deny like the progress each season's gotten better each time. And like even even Woolley, who who is so bored of watching defensive football, he could understand why a team like Carlow might have started out defensively. But like, if you're self reflecting now and looking to progress again in the third season, is there anything? Did you think yourself that you might have got too predictable? Like, if you couldn't transition, you couldn't score as easily. Did you, did you find that this year? And is that something yeah, that you're well, targeting? Well, I suppose go back to go back to day one and and we looked at it and the first thing the South and Turlock done was we done a real analysis of where we were and where we were coming from you know we were coming from having the worst defensive record in in the thirty two counties you know uh, you know we could, we had conceded I think something like one hundred and twenty nine points I think was our against record mm. you know going back three four years ago and we were sort of saying well, we can't win football matches with that you know so you have to start there it's like a defensive shape if you've got a defensive platform it's like building a house going you know you start with the foundation and you build up you know you don't start at the top and build down you know and for us that was the important thing and I think year one was installing that and you know I suppose people were very critical of the way we played against Dublin the way we played against Monaghan but <laughs> remember we were coming from the bottom of Division 4 to competing against two of the top four teams in the country and like with five minutes to go against Monaghan we were a point up you know in the 64th minute we were a point up and you know we, we, we made ourselves competitive and I suppose then year two was, was the next progression you know can we can we add to the offensive end of things and I suppose statistically when you look at things you know we had a plus 35 
goal difference last year, which was the best in the four divisions. I think we hammered in 15 goals. We put 217 past the Division 2 team and 214 past the Division 1 team. You know, so there was there was stages last year where we did show signs of, of improvement offensively. And believe it or not, like regardless of what anybody thinks, you could, the players will tell you themselves, everything we do in training is based around offensive play. Like, And that's that's actually true, Bill. You know, and every game finishes with a score, starts with a score and finishes with a score. You know, and that's, mm. that's just the way we coach. That's the way we play. The boys enjoy it. And, you know, I, I, I think there's maybe a stigma attached to Carlo because of the games against Leash, you know, that were maybe highlighted a bit more. And, you know, to be fair to Leash, you have to be honest, John Subaru is a, a shrewd operator. He's a good coach. But, you know, <laughs> there was no team as, as, as well-versed in the dark arts as, as Leash were last year. You know, they were very good at checking your runs off the ball and getting away with it and things. And I hold my hands up. You, you know, you, you play with the strengths and, you know, whatever goes, you go. See, you know, and I just felt that at least we're probably, you know, the second best team we played last year outside of Tyrone, to be honest. You know, I thought they were very well organised, excellent defensively, you know, retained the ball superbly well. And, you know, it's just probably them games were probably hated a bit more, Conan, you know, that, that, than, than the games against the likes of, you know, for talks, just for talks sake here, you know, we had a fantastic win away to Waterford where I think we scored two or three fifteen possibly, I think it was. I can't remember statistically now what it was, but you know, we were I think the first three National League games we were averaging two fourteen, two fifteen a game, you know, and mm. those games weren't highlighted. It was just really the, the games against Leeds that were probably highlighted and then there was a stigma attached to it, you know. So um, you know, we we played within our strengths in the championship, but you know, I thought against Slowies we were absolutely superb and I think 217, I'm not too sure what came from play, like, but you know the same against Kildare. I know we did get a lot of place balls against Kildare, like, but the reason we scored free kicks was because we were getting ourselves into an offensive situation anyway. You know, So, look, it's, it's, I'm not really here to defend the way we play or what we do, like, but no, exactly. at the same time, yeah. I, think, I think at the same time, you know, I think the, the stride, I don't think, I don't think there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an actual grasp of where we've come from, Conan. I really don't. I don't think people are grasping at all where we come from. Like, you know, when, when, when Turlock arrives down the training and they're bottom of Division 4 and the job's being described to him as the poison chalice and he's going to training and there's 12 guys at training, you know, and, and maybe three or four of them aren't fit to play senior football, you know. So, like, I think, I think when, you, when you look at where we're coming from now and, and, or where, where he's come from and where he is now, I think, you know the whole thing deserves a, a lot of praise and a lot of credit you know oh yeah and like that's like listen like I agree like and God knows I've had enough arguments with Willie but I suppose like I would just in his absence <laughs> I would just ask like you know do you think like he would say I didn't see the, the leash game but his like sort of story of it is that you know they set up defensively and because they did that you couldn't break them down and is that, I was thinking is that part of the reason why you've added to the backroom team now to try and you know to have something else to your arsenal listen I, su- I suppose it- I, I say this to players even, you know, in football, going, if you stand still, you go backwards, you know, and, and that's that's life, you know, if you stand still and everybody moves forward, you go backwards, and, you know, any sport's the same, you look at soccer, for example, you look at rugby, you know, if teams if teams stand still and think that that's going to be good enough, then it's it's not, you know, but, look, I suppose for me, you know, if, you, if you're talking about the Leash games and you go back to the Leash games, I suppose in the league final, like, you know, we had created three or four great goal scoring opportunities, and I think if we'd have taken one of those, you know, it, it could have it could have been a different game, the same in the championship game as well, we were very unlucky in the, in the Leinster semi final on a couple of little occasions and I know you know when you're watching the game and you're not impartial and you're either a leash man or a carlo man you probably can't see that but when I actually you know cut the game down and analyse it through a video and go back through it really really stringently and analytically you know look at the game and in, in, in finer detail you know we created a lot of moments there where we were denied with maybe a poor decision or you know maybe just a, 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 che- a run and being checked off the ball that maybe a free that should have been given or a goal chance that maybe didn't happen and you know those are small moments like and I suppose listen the way it was was more or less that's how those games evolved and I think as well people are, are quick to forget as well like there's a rivalry and a derby element to it as well you know and a lot of our players maybe played the occasion and maybe played the fact that it was Leash and maybe if it had been Westmead or Wexford or, or Offaly it, it might have been a completely different game you know but maybe mm. the fact that it was that local rivalry maybe the fact that there is that history and tradition between the two teams and I didn't really understand it until I got to Carlo, like, and then I didn't really understand it until I seen how passionate uh, 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 Woolly, Woolly is about not talking about Carlo, you know, but he, uh, no, but I, I didn't really understand the rivalry that exists until I get down there, you know, and I, I see that and I know the likes of Greg Cullen and stuff like that is very close to Carlo and there's the least players would socialise in Carlo and vice versa, Carlo players socialise in Leeds and there's an element of that too, uh, Cullen, there's no doubt about it, like, you know, regardless of what way the two teams set up, there is an element of derby issue about it as well too, you know, it's, it's a bit like when, you know, Fermanagh played Armagh last year, the two teams know each other so well, they played each other three times and, you know, the, the championship game was, was 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 a war of attrition. Like I think Armagh were beat ten seven or something and people were saying it was horrible, it was a terrible game. Then two, three weeks later 
Armagh go and play Roscommon in one of the best games of football of the year, you know, mm. and, and, and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, there has to be, there has to be something there, like, you know, so some teams, when they come against each other, maybe nullify each other, and, but every game's different, and I think that's why you may be coming under the rules, I think that we need to be careful what direction we're going in football, Conan, because I think if we're going to try and force every team to play the same, you know, I, I think it'd be a boring spectacle, I think that's what we're trying to do, you know, like, yeah. every game has to be different, I could name you games now, for example, and I named one there, Armagh Roscommon, but let's look, Leash Wexford was a brilliant game of football, the first round of the Leinster. The boys were all down at it. Uh, Leash were 10 points down, came back, won an extra time. Phenomenal game of football. Tyrone Monaghan up in Oma was outstanding game of football. You know, Kildare and Mayo, the game of the summer. You know, ourselves and Kildare, fantastic game of football. You know, even the semi-final, Tyrone and Monaghan, so intriguing, like, you know, high-scoring, intriguing, tactical warfare. I actually sat and was just amazed at the strategic element of the kickouts, for example. I was just, I was obsessed to watching Rory Began and Niall Morgan to see what was going to come next, you know. And like, I, I think we're trying, we're going to lose all that. And I, and I felt last year football was sort of coming back round to becoming more offensive. And I, and I do, I mean that, you know, genuinely. And I do feel that, you know, there's two patterns of, or there's two patterns of, of attack and play for me. You either run the ball or you kick the ball. You know, the good teams can do both. They can mix it up. You know, you watch Dublin scores last year, some of them against Tyrone, you know, and, and you watch the likes of Owen Merck and the way he broke from defence. And, you know, but there is a, there's a time when you do need to retain the ball. You know, there's a time when possession is important and there's a time then when kick passing is important. You know, it's nearly the, the Zoom crew, Zoom element. Like, you know, do you go hard with a fast break and get the ball early forward or do you bide your time and, and be more patient, you know? And it's the same in all sports. You know, every sport evolves and every sport has got tactics. Every sport has got different teams that play different ways. And you look at soccer recently there and the outcry about Mourinho and, like, you know, and you look at the way Klopp sets his team up and the way Mourinho, like, everybody's different. You know, like, like I think Sean Dyke, I've used this example before with Burnley, you know, he finished sixth in the Premiership with Burnley by scoring something like 37 goals. You know, it's unheard of. You yeah. know, but that was the, that, he played to his strengths and he played a certain way and you knew what you were going to get and other teams will play a different way. And, you know, I, 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 I use soccer as an analogy, like 4-4-2 counter-attack under Alex Ferguson. Then it went to, you know, a sort of a more sort of Spain-type game in around the late noughties where you had that sort of ghost striker, ghost number nine. It was a 4 6 knot formation and keep possession. And then it's now, we've now evolved now to a 4 3 3 and high press. And I think Gaelic evolves naturally too. You know, like I know Wally's mentioned in the show before about Jim McGuinness and things like that, but those days are gone. Like, you know, they are gone. Like, you know, the, it's not as negative as that anymore. Like, it really, it's really not. Like, and when you watch the, the, the you know, people talk about the hurling and things like that, but there's a lot of poor hurling games too. I was in Dr. Colin Park this year for the Limerick. Carlo game was an event, you know, mm. and, and, you know, in the name of job. So, like, there's a lot of, I, I just think what we need to improve is the exposure to these games. Like, Lee Wexford, for example, first round of the championship, why not give that game 15 minutes on the Sunday game instead of giving the game that was on live that day a half an hour, you know, that people have already seen, you know, give that game the exposure and people might say, you know, our game, I think our punditry, I think that's what needs improved. I don't think it's the rules. I think the level of punditry and the level of analysis within the game needs improved and the exposure that the smaller counties get as well needs improved, you know, and that's my only worry, you know, and I've maybe been offline a little bit here, but it's my only worry about the talk of the B Championship, and I've heard in the QT that it's a done deal for 2020, but, like, for me, you know, that's my worry, is that if I was to say to someone who's in the edges of the hurling fraternity, who won the Joe McDonough Cup last year? I would say 50, 60% of those people couldn't tell you who won it. Now, the, only, the only reason I know who won it is because it was Carlo, yeah. but that was the B competition. And like they got the column inches they got, Conan was it was embarrassing. Like well, yeah. I, I felt sorry for the lads. You know they got a snippet in the paper, and I think they got fifteen twenty seconds in the Sunday game. You know, and we're talking about oh, it'll improve. It, not, it won't improve anything. You know, that's that's the worry for me. You know, the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. Yeah, and that's like you know because obviously we we talk about oh you know we'll give them uh, Division Two All Stars and stuff. But like we got Division Two, we got Christy Ring All Stars. Like you know, but we didn't talk about it here. Like and. You know, I, I do I do agree with you at the at the expense of sounding like a bit of an echo chamber here, but but just talk to me about the the new rules. Like you've seen four games now, I think, and I'm just interested. Yeah. Obviously, the hand pass is the big one. Like I like the, of the games I've seen, I've seen two. It still seems like it's pretty easy to keep possession if you want to, and like the people are getting blown up for times when you actually really need a hand pass when you're coming out of a tight area or coming out of the corner. Like, and it's just there's a lot of groans because it seems very needless sometimes when the referee's blowing it up. No, there's no doubt. Listen, for me, I've seen five games actually now I've, and, I've, and I've watched them uh, very placidly uh, from a distance. And to be honest with you, you know, I, I'm going to be honest, I, I bit my tongue when the rules came out. A lot of people came out with outcries and talked about them. I sort of said, no, I'm going to give these a chance, you know. But after five games, I've watched four of Carlos' games and I've watched the neutral game as well. I watched the university team playing Armagh. And to be honest with you, you know, the, the hand pass rule 
Cool, it's, it's a shambles. It really is a shambles because we're trying to create something that's not natural. You know, that really, it really is not natural. And it's not natural to our game. We're creating a hybrid version of the game. You know, the referee, and for me, the biggest, the biggest issue, and this is something, I'd be interested to hear a poll from referees. Not now, but give the referees two or three weeks of a Born Cup, McKenna Cup, etc., and let them sort of see, because I, I know from speaking to a couple of referees, and I'm not naming them, but I know from speaking to a couple of misses, TV, we're finding it very, very hard to process everything. You know, and I think if referees are some, referees are probably afraid to maybe come out because they maybe don't want to lose, you know, their, their presence or whatever among the hierarchy, and maybe they don't want to be, you know, because it, it might be held against them if, if the rules stay in, that maybe, well, well, he's complained about them. So, but I'd love to know the insight from referees because they're having to deal with so much. And I'll tell you what teams are doing now, Colin, what's interesting. And, um, you know, on the, on the second pass, teams are shouting, he has to kick it, he has to kick it. So they're listening to that, and there's a lot of, you know, the referees having to process all that. And then, for example, we played Westmeath, and I think they were shouting, he has to kick it, he has to kick it. And we actually made our third hand pass, and the ref blew it as a free, yeah. because he probably was trying to process it, you know, and, and it's just it's just too much, it's too much happening. Now, yes, there's there's maybe there's maybe an argument for the mark inside, or whatever it happens to be, but what I've noticed from teams are doing now, uh, are getting two men double sweepers really back in really quickly to cut out either side of the inside line to cut out that mark element if that makes sense so they're getting two men straight back in as soon as they lose the ball you know shut it down or whatever they're getting two men back in and they're cutting out that area that a player would root, would move into because the mark necessarily in fact people probably think the mark twin towers Tommy Walsh Keir Donaghy but it's actually the opposite you know you're looking for inside men that are really good at lateral movement who can move into space and collect the ball on the run and put their hand up and tap one over the bar, you know. So it's not so much a big man on the edge of the square. You know, it's actually a more measured pass. You can pass the ball from just outside the 45, 20 metres into a man's chest who's running onto it. But teams are filing men back really quick, so that just cuts that element out. So the only way you're going to break a team down like that is by being patient and moving the ball from one sideline to the other, you know, through, through maybe a bit more possession, being a bit more patient, you know, waiting for late runners to come, waiting for those gaps, stretching teams, you know. But... Like I, I did feel sorry for some of the teams that we played against, not even ourselves, because there was some great moves. A kick pass in a centre half forward who led it off, a couple of runners coming, and on the third pass, he just needed one more, even to open up a goal opportunity or even open up a scoring opportunity. And he was blown up because he turned to try to come back and he was turned over or he had to get a shot away unnaturally, you know. But I was chatting to a couple of university managers and uh, I know Wally's given me stick for being cynical in the past, but this actually didn't come from me. But he, uh, a couple of university managers who actually said to me, look, Stevie, if we're going down one channel and we get bogged up, we're going to turn and kick the ball back 70 yards to our goalkeeper. And I thought, Jesus, like, like that's, that's what we could be watching an awful lot of because when the stakes get higher, it's all right now going and looking at the McKenna Cup and the Bourne Cup. Like, we played Kildare the other day and we give, I think, nine players their debut, their senior debut. And it's unfair in them too because... These young lads are coming. Like Kildare is bringing in Jimmy Highland, for example. Jimmy Highland's an all Ireland under twenty winner, and they filled their team with most of the first team the other day. So they were quite confident in the way they played the game. But we're bringing in lads who have played junior football or intermediate football in Carlow who have never played senior county football in their lives. They're coming in to get a taste of the game, and they're having to process all this as well. Yeah, like it's so difficult and so hard in them, you know, as well to make the step up because it's hard enough going to make that step up. Like it really is. No matter without having to process all this as a player, you know, and you're finding then players will get their hand pass back get your tree back, they're shouting, and they'll take a wee dink ball five yards, like, you know, and it's, it's it just makes the, I think it makes the game very unnatural, you know, and, and, a, and a bit of a hybrid version, you know, so, yeah. the sin bin, I've no issue with, I've no issue with the sin bin. Sideline balls, does it really make a difference? I don't know, you know, but, and the kick in the 20 metre line, you know, for me personally, Stephen Cluxon revolutionised our game, like Stephen Cluxon went from an average of 15 seconds every kick out to getting the kick out down in eight seconds. Like that was brilliant. So your ball and play stats, you know, good teams will want the ball and play stats to be high. So good teams will want the ball and play. For example, for example, Leinster rugby, their their stats of keeping the ball and play are way hugely higher than anybody else because you know they they want that ball alive. They want the ball. They want the game played at a high tempo, high pace. Dublin are the same. Dublin want their, their the ball and play stats very high. So the average time for a ball and play in a 70 minute game is around about 32, 33 minutes. But that's actually gone through the roof recently because the balls in play a lot more. Keepers are getting the ball away quicker. You know, tactically, I think the game's evolved to a different level. It's interesting and intriguing now some of the battles you have. Players physically are a lot fitter, a lot sharper. You know, I, I think we've got a great game, a great product. Going. I think we need to be very careful where we're going. Like, You know, I think we've got a great brand, a great game, a great sport. And like, if people were to watch the National League, if some of these games that I spoke about were to get more exposure, you would actually see that we've got a lot of good football games out there. You yeah, know, a lot of yeah. good football being played. Because we need to you promote the National League more than what we do is another thing. Because we have this Absolutely. great competition here that yeah. we don't. We always just say that should be the championship. It's like, well, we have the league; it's great. Enjoy it, and then we'll enjoy the championship. Yeah. But but tell me, like, I think I suppose the argument would be 
that of course that you'll come out against the rules because it doesn't suit you because like you know again Willie's idea and I think it'd be easier to defend with the rules but his idea is that it's harder to transition up the pitch because you'll need a kick pass so how would you sort of respond to that like you know that of course oh, you're no, sort of we, we've, 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 we've actually we've actually got some brilliant like Daniel and Ledger Brennan Murphy and Darfo they're like some of them men are some of the best kick passes of the ball I've ever worked with like the best kick pass of the ball I ever worked with was, was Martin Clark like and, and you know Brendan's the same like the phenomenal kick passes of the ball like 60, 70, 80 yards like no so there's no issue there like we're not concerned in that element I, I'm concerned for the game in general not ourselves like you know and I think every team's got concerns I think Malachi Rooks come out this week with concerns I think Kieran McGinney's come out this week with concerns you know and I suppose the dubs will not come out and say anything because they never say anything. But <laughs> deep down, but privately behind the scenes, they are concerned. And I think you know, you know, I, I've heard rumblings on the QT that you know they wouldn't be too overly pleased with the rules. But you know, so like it's not just us; it's not me. You know, I think in general, I think in general, teams will start to realise in the next few weeks. You know, I spoke to Benny Coulter the other day. Benny's in with Paddy Talley this year as well, and like Benny, Benny you know, one of the most natural forwards that, that the game's seen. And Benny said to me, Steve, it's a farce, you know, it's, it's a joke, you know. And, and he, I met him the other day and we're just chatting about it in general. Like, And he says, like, the couple of games they've played as well, he says, it's terrible. Like, he says, it's just so unnatural. He says, if you're in trouble in the halfway and you're turning, you're kicking the ball back just to start reset again, you know. And, and that's allowing teams then to filter back. So it's actually becoming a lot slower. The game's coming a lot slower. And I actually think it's going to make the game a little more defensive. I know that might sound mad, but I do I actually do think it'll make it a more defensive. And then you get the situation going on. This sounds extreme, like, but you know, I'm thinking about it all the time. And you're thinking, do we get the situation where you're three, four points up in a game of 10 minutes to go and you just filter everybody back and you kick for touch? Seriously, like, like our team's going to start doing that where they just kick the ball 70 yards down the field and say, right, come at us again. So they've only got three hand passes. They're never going to break us down. You know, you know that sort of way. You know, yeah. are we going to get to that stage? You know, where, where you know you're going to you're going to go back into the dark ages again, where it's like literally. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm I'm only thinking out loud here, but I'm I'm just worried. I, I'm worried about the direction the game will go. You know, if these rules remain in, I, I am worried, and I, I really don't think we need to be altering the game as much as we as we as we do. You know, and like there was a few rules brought in a couple of years ago. I remember the hand pass rule. It had to be a play strike of the ball and things. So that rule now. Is, I don't think I've ever seen one of those blown. Actually, in fact, I've seen one blown in the last minute of the Great Door Scotstown match. And to be fair, it probably was the correct decision. It was a throw ball. <laughs> what was it? The throw ball. Throw the ball about. <laughs> It was like, but teams are throwing the ball about like a basketball now, and there's no the referee's not blowing anything, you know. So like, you, you know, sometimes I think we just bring rules in for the sake of it at times, you know. But these rules, these rules aren't small rules. Like these are these are monumental. This is a different game, Conan. Mm. This is actually a different game now. It's and and I don't mean that. And I know Willie would argue whatever. It's a it's a game that's going to be better, but I don't think it is. I think we're it's becoming a very hybrid version of Gaelic football. And and as I said before, I think we've got a brilliant game. I think there's been some class games this year. You know, I, I love watching Dublin. I love watching them, even though people might be bored of them winning. I, I'm intrigued by them. I'm intrigued by their matchups, how how well they get them right. I'm intrigued about the way they break out of defence, the pace in which they transition. I like their they're the most organised team defensively in the country, whether people would argue against it or not. Tyrone went five one up against them last year. They dropped everybody back, fifteen back, you know, and you could see how defensively organised they were at that stage, like, you know, and, and you know, the game, the game is. I think the game's in a good place. I think there's some. There's been some poor games, of course, there has. But, but I, I just don't think it's as bad as everybody thinks it is. I really don't. You know, I, I really don't. And I think we need to be very careful in the direction we're going with, with these rules. We really do. You know, Stephen, thanks very much. Got another problem. Okay, I won't call Paddy Power predictions. We'll just call it Paddy Power. Here's what's coming up over the <laughs> yeah, next few weeks. Enough, yeah. <laughs> um, so because we have no idea, like we have no idea what these teams are going to be playing. Like so, there's obviously O'Burn Cup and McKenna Cup on Thursday night. That's tomorrow. So obviously we're playing Kildare. We have no idea what teams are going to play and what they're like in the new yeah, in the new yeah. game that we have here. Um, I'm hoping that Derry are better in the three hand pass rule than <laughs> they are in the normal. But they're playing own in Celtic Park actually at 8 p.m. So. I don't hold out much hope to be honest too. Uh, Kerry are playing Limerick in the Munster Senior Hurling League uh, 7.30pm Austin Stack Park Wexford against Leash uh, in a score for the Burn Cup 8pm um, Saturday 29th for the season I'm really jumping ahead now but this is all that's left for yeah, the year yeah. so I might as well um, Claire v Cork Senior Hurling League it's just thrown in on its own 2pm at Cusick Park and Sunday 30th of December McKenna Cup Cavan v Down Breffney Park Donegal v Queens Bally Buffet Monaghan v Antrim Clonus 2 p.m. and actually we got the fixtures there during the week of the All Ireland Club hurling and football semi-finals, which is more interesting. Um, which are on when? 
They're on February 9th and February 16th. So the Hurlings on February 9th and the footballs February 16th. Is there a potential clash with Sigerson or Fitzgibbon, I wonder? <sighs> yeah, probably actually. And there's no there's no um double header either, which is they never really do it. Like and I know the problem the worry is like for example you take the Hurling, you have a team from Galway, team from Antrim, team from Waterford and Limerick, so they're probably worried about where is the yeah, middle yeah, point for all yeah. four of them. But St Thomas is a goal where you're playing uh, Christian Dahl Rory Oog, um, so that's in Parnell Park in Dublin 3pm they could have had both of them in Parnell Park to be honest yeah Bally Hale are from Kilkenny are playing Bally Gunner um, I said Limerick um, that's at 5pm at Seppel Stadium that's February 9th there's no point in me telling you what time it's at really like, <laughs> yeah. you're not making these we've plans we've got 6 like, weeks to tell you yeah right? and the Corofin Guido it's on Carrick on Shannon uh, it's the next week 1.30pm I might as well keep going <laughs> and Mullen Yachta against Dr. Crooks is in Sample Stadium in Tipperary at 3.30pm on Sunday February 16th that's all we have time for it. and we have one more show left for the whole year and um, we're going to leave you be over Christmas you know just like those club managers yeah. that like don't leave you alone we're going to leave you alone yeah, no like, talk championship structures yeah. nothing like that nothing no. like that not until 31st of December <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Gonna 2nd have, of January maybe. <laughs> we're going to have an all show for you on New Year's Eve and um, that's it I wish you all a very Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas yeah and I hope it's a I hope it's a good one enjoy enjoy <laughs>